This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Can San Francisco be saved? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Senior Producer for Reason, joined by my co-host Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Daily Reason Roundup. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. San Francisco, the beautiful city on the bay, has become a national punchline. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis displayed a map of citywide poop sightings, which were apparently reported to 311 more than 35,000 times over the past year. He did that during his debate with California Governor Gavin Newsom last year. The population started slumping in 2018, but has slowly crawled back. And a 2022 San Francisco Chronicle poll found 65% of respondents say life is worse in the city now than when they moved there. Today's guest, Mike Solana, spends a lot of his time in San Francisco and wants to be part of the solution. He's the chief marketing officer at Founders Fund, the Peter Thiel-founded VC firm, and editor-in-chief of Pirate Wires, a media company covering tech from the Silicon Valley perspective. He's also the self-described, though probably not actual, billionaire former mayor of San Francisco, but we'll work to get confirmation on that. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And come on, a disinformation researcher like me would never lie. (laughs) (laughs) You should be our truth czar. You should be our new Nina Jankowicz. I'll take the job. I don't think the job should exist, but if it has to exist, I definitely want the job. It should be you, obviously, yeah. Yeah. How how did that come about, by the way? There was some sort of article that described you as a billionaire seeking mayor... Uh, uh, Mayoral nomination or something? Like, what happened? I mean, every one of them... I collect titles. It's like... like, (laughs) I I just collect... They're given to me and I take them. Um, Yeah. This one was... I think that... For a moment, and it was really a local politics, like a state politics thing, actually. It wasn't a tech thing. It wasn't a random shit poster thing. It wasn't a tech journalist versus us tech people thing. It was local Mm -hmm. politics. It was, uh, let's just say they're not setting their best. It's like a lower (laughs) IQ, generally speaking, when you're in the lower, when you're in the local politics arena. And uh, the perception at that time, it's like, let's say 2020-ish, 2021, um, of people highly engaged in local politics, the state and uh, and city level, was that we were all extremely rich. Anyone who was like from tech talking to them was extremely rich. And so I would give billionaire a lot. People thought that I, they, would, they would throw that around. It was already something that I thought was funny. Um, and then Lorena Gonzalez, who was a state rep at that time from San Diego, I believe. And she was one of the crazier ones. Now she's out of of yeah. politics she's uh, the one that basically drove elon musk out of the city right yes famously told him uh fuck you i believe and then he said yeah. message delivered or or something like that so yeah it was like <laughs> that one uh we got into it i don't remember what it was now but she accused me accused me of being a billionaire and at that point i was like oh my god this is definitely just like a part of my brand so that was the genesis of it thank you Lorena. she made me a billionaire can never <laughs> give her enough credit for that I laid out some of the uh, the sobering facts about San Francisco, and we'll go a little bit deeper into the stats in a minute. But I'd love to just get your impressions as a resident of how things are going right now. Well, I am actually full time uh, out of the city now. I'm gonna. Okay. I was I was there during COVID. I was there the year after. We cover it. We have a writer here. Um, mm-hmm. I'm here a lot for work, like once every I would say like a week, every five weeks or something. Um, mm-hmm. I still love it. Follow it very closely. Those are, yeah, regular someone who's regularly checking in on San Francisco. Yeah, that, here right like, now in also, yeah, but also right, someone who yeah. left for a reason, ostensibly, right? I mean, you wouldn't no, have left. I want to pause. If, I'm gonna. So okay. no, actually, I okay. love San Francisco, and I'm gonna. I'm. Okay. De- I don't. I think you're a defender. Is, yeah, I'm a San Francisco defender. I've always okay. been. This is, I think, the misunderstood thing. People, generally speaking, misunderstand this about me. I criticize it a lot. But that's not because I hate it. It's because I think it could be and should be the greatest city in the world. It is just like goaded in terms of beautiful geography, in terms of local resources. You know, you're right by all of the farmland in California, Napa Valley. You have Tahoe above that. The weather is, well, it's cold and foggy, but 
immediately outside of it. Amazing. And I also, live in yeah. New York, so it's not cold to me, right? right. Like, it's not as cold as New York. Westland. Yeah. Incredible number of, uh, incredible concentration of talented people, resources. It should be amazing. And it's not. Um, and I want to get it there. I think it's actually not quite as bad as it was a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's the weird contrarian take on San Francisco because this has been a real fight for like four years at this point. Um, lots of smart people have gotten involved. Lots of people with money have gotten involved. And the pol the politics, at least in the city, state's still a disaster, but at least in the city have, I mean, they're still terrible, right? But it's like there has been a tilt back to the moderates away from the hardcore progressives. It's been a long journey. There have been a bunch of recall elections. So the recall of the Board of Education, there were three members of the Board of Ed that were recalled, the, not even the craziest ones, just the ones that were able to be recalled. Well, two of them were the craziest. The third was just stuck in the crossfires because he happened to be have been there long enough to be recalled. Then you had the recall of Chesa Bowden, the district attorney, um, the sort of famously pro-crime district attorney. Uh, and then there were a couple of moderates who won elections for the Board of Supervisors. The next election, I think, will be a huge signal. The problem is the mayor sucks, but all of her competitors or her, her most likely competitor is even worse. So there's not really a, a great solution there. But so if you're playing on a scale of like 10 or 15 years, I, th I think that San Francisco has a pretty good chance. And I say on the poop map, yeah. <laughs> while there is still a lot of human shit on the ground... I think it is a lot less than like a few yeah. years ago. And that was really So maybe about... they were shamed into picking it up. No, it was corruption. So the guy in charge of all of that was is now in jail for corruption. And I think it was like almost overnight. Oh. Like once he was kicked out, things did get better. They're still atrocious, but there were improvements once he was gone. The wait, way how was about... he res wait, hold on one second. How was he responsible for there being shit all over the sidewalks? Well, I think he just wasn't doing corrupt. his job. He was in charge of oh. the, yeah. uh, the whatever the the organizations in San Francisco that's responsible for cleaning the streets. And so, I mean, yeah, yeah. I guess a bigger problem is there are people in San Francisco who would shit on the ground, um, a lot no. of them, but the city's sort of cleaning function wasn't I turned see. on at that point because the guy in charge of it was a criminal. So now that that's over, things are a little bit better. Again, everything's like a little bit right. better. Um, and I'm hoping to push it into like actually good territory. The way you feel about San Francisco well, is very much the way I feel about New York. And there's something very frustrating. Like I criticize New York constantly. I have an entire scene, uh, you know, thing called Scenes from New York in my morning newsletter, Reason Roundup, where I frequently cover issues related to like New York crime and public safety. None of this is coming from a place of hatred uh, for New York or disdain for New York. It's rather coming from the sense of like, well, wait a second, we're a city of 8 million people. Some of the wealthiest and most talented and most innovative people live here. And yet we still can't manage to get a situation where yeah. we don't have people stabbed, you know, granny stabbed in broad daylight and rats running around all over the place. I mean, come on, really? It's like we have people hopping the turnstile, you know, refusing to pay their subway fare, like constantly. And so I I love it so deeply that I want it to be a good place for my family to live for forever, for my kid to, you know, live, choose to live here as an adult for future generations to be New Yorkers in, you know, the same and get the things out of the city that I get from it, right? Like it's all of this harshness for, for for me at least is coming from this place of like well, wait a second we live in the best country on the earth and i think i live in one of the best cities um and and it's 2024 like this is the best possible time to be alive in one of the best possible places and so it's not as if we're not taxing people enough where exactly is this money going and that's the root of my frustration at least yeah new york city should it's like America's capital. You know, that's the real, it's yeah. not DC, it's New York. And so, that it's embarrassing when I was just in Paris. Um, and I don't want to give it to the French. Come on. But yeah. that is Horrible. a beautiful city. Like how, I looked around and there are so many huge problems in Europe that despite all of them do not amount to a city that is not functioning. Um, it was well policed. It was beautiful. It was clean. There was housing. Um, a lot of that you know, was built a long time ago. Maybe the whole world is, you know, super nimbyish now at this point, uh, or you can't really do city planning really much anymore in these different cities, right. but it's, it's mm -hmm. really, shame. it's, yeah, it's, it's a total embarrassment. And I think a lot of it is corruption and we just turn, we just turn away in San Francisco. So we had a piece on where the money in homelessness goes. And so you've lost 
I mean, I think it was, it's 20 something billion dollars in the state of California that they don't know where it went. It was, that was spent towards, that was spent to help. It's never get rid of homelessness. It's like, how, like, let's help yeah. the problem of, of, of homelessness or they have some new word for homelessness now. That's like, is it houseless or one of those unhoused, yeah. unhoused, something like that. So it's like, let's help them with 20 plus billion dollars. That's gone now. And the question is, yeah. okay, well, how is the problem actually, why are there more homeless people now? And that's a separate question from where the money went, which is to nonprofits that are funded by the government and just waste and, and sort of in, in grift and fraud. But the nonprofits is really the problem. You have this huge nonprofit industrial complex that is just pumped with money from taxpayers. All of these things are, so all these little organizations are, are designed to take a piece of some problem or whatever the government doesn't want to manage. They do want to spend money on it and say, look, we're helping. But in practice, what is this? It's a giant vote buying scheme. All the people who work for the nonprofits vote for the Democrats. They also campaign for the Democrats um, and the Democrats run every city in the country. So uh, separate from your politics, just the idea of one party states in all of these cities is, I think, a huge part of the problem here. Yeah. And it's not as though we have no clue how to cope with this problem. There are other cities in America. Liz and I co-produced a documentary in Texas about this very issue, comparing California's approach to approaches in places like Houston, where they have developed what should probably be considered at this point best practices in terms of how to guide someone from you know dying on the street into an emergency shelter and then slowly transition them into uh, you know less and less you know rule bound conditions until they can function or get diverted to some place where they can get some permanent form of health uh, help but uh, <laughs> california still yeah. because i guess of these uh, political issues has not well, been reagan. able to they blame adopt. reagan it's all reagan's fault <laughs> Yeah. Ronald Reagan, not even as president, but as the governor of California. That's mm -hmm. what they blame. So we're talking. Why do they blame? Why do they blame Reagan? Because he he shut down the insane. It's crazy. They they blame him for. Yeah. They, they say, well, he shut yes. down the insane asylums. But it's like, great, let's open them back up again. No, we could never do that. We could never open up insane asylums. So they kind of try and have it both ways. It's not Reagan's fault. I mean, come on, it's like not even worth talking about. I just refuse to engage with anyone who blames anything. I don't even let them blame Bush anymore. I'm not going to let them blame Reagan. This is ridiculous. <laughs> You're, the Democrats have been in charge of California for like six decades. Like, it's your is problem. There, is there a deep-seated belief that it's such an intractable, intractable problem that there's really no way of solving it? I mean, where does this come from, this, this opposition? specifically? Yeah. I, I think it is, man, it's a complicated, weird social problem. Yeah. Um, the political problem is easier. It's just there's a lot of money because people are really well-meaning in, in probably everywhere. But in California, they really do want that. No one yeah. wants there to be homelessness. And this like, say what you will about liberals, like generally speaking, they care a lot about this issue. They're like, well, yeah, we should do something. Let's and in their mind is just let's give them money. Um, let's give them other people's money more likely. Mm -hmm. Um that is on the political side. It's the grift. It's what I just described. It's the nonprofit sort of drain on this um, and all these people getting paid really just to vote. But then socially, like, why does it persist or psychologically? I This is a crazy one. I sort of think that people with this sort of like toxic empathy thing and even and socialist as well, like it. They like to see it. They like to see signs indicating that like <laughs> capitalism is bad and America is bad. It's like these people are sort of totemic reminders of their worldview. They've they kind of keep them around as pets that um, make them feel better about themselves and their beliefs. I think it's Isn't like, that too cynical by a lot. I mean, I think I have a practical one, which is the grift and then a cynical. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if it's cynical. It's just that's how I think about. I think that people <laughs> in this city you know, they're, were, yeah. were hard left. Like, yeah, they want to see it. I think it, it, it mm -hmm. makes them feel like they're correct in their in their politics. I mean, need some sort of radical change. And oh, then the other one is yeah, housing. I, Sorry, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm like as <laughs> quite as cynical, but I think one, one um, strand of that where I'm kind of in agreement is that when you start talking about DSA, D Democratic Socialist type activists in these cities, I, I've seen it before where they will 
oppose any sort of practical, pragmatic solution, and they will just hold out until yeah. we have, you know, government yeah. housing for yes. everybody or something like uh, it's that or nothing. And so that sort of cynical political game leads to human uh, tragedy. And there's not really like uh, an ounce of caring about what's actually happening. Housing is perfect issue because we're talking about the difference between everyone here's like common sense approaches. We need beds with maybe nursing staff and food and showers for people. No. And we can do that. We can, we have what, 8,000 homeless people in San Francisco or something. That's not an impossible problem to solve. College dorms have been doing it for a very long time. Like we can figure this out. Um, the problem is all of the people in charge at the city level are hyper ideologically obsessed with the idea that every single person who moves to San Francisco and they are moving here. And a lot of them are drug tourists is entitled to a free one bedroom apartment, at least for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that's, there's a giant wait list for that. And every little bit of government created housing, um, is that, and then they bring people off the street and put them up forever. And so not only do we have a homeless problem in San Francisco, but where a lot of the money goes separate from the grift is keeping people, keeping people housed, they say, what they mean by that is paying people's rent. Um, and once you build up this class of people in every city, I think has this problem. I just am very familiar with it in San Francisco. Uh, we have a huge class of people who are just living off of the city in actual yeah. nice apartments and will forever until that problem, until we run out of money, at which point I have no idea how that problem, it, what goes on at that point. It seems like a disaster. Isn't the common objection, I mean, I noticed this when Zach and I were, were reporting out um, our documentary comparing Texas homelessness um, and approaches to solving it to California's approaches you know, a lot of homeless people, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this, will simply refuse to go to shelters um, where they yeah. don't actually have their own space and their own privacy in part because of, you know, rampant violence or fear of violence um, because of issues with addiction, because we're talking about a very mentally unstable um, population of people. And so there are real reasons why people would refuse that type of congregate living environment and choose to instead sleep on the streets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you how do you grapple with that real challenge that pretty much all homeless providers sort of attest to? Yeah, I mean, there are a bunch of challenges there. I think the, the drug one, though, is probably the one that is. The no one really wants to to accept. I think we want to yeah. believe that in the idea of homelessness as like this down and out single mother with three kids living out of her van and she has a job and she's trying her best and she just needs a leg up. In fact, most of the homeless people you see in San Francisco are drug addicts and um so you have a separate crime problem of not even just obviously doing like meth or something is illegal but the bigger problem are the drug dealers in the city oh. and uh sort of dealing fentanyl and meth with impunity um right. and once that happens people are going to just congregate wherever the drug when you're it did it when you're a drug addict you go where the drugs are and so in san francisco this is where you can find drugs and that's where people go so i don't it's Law and order is one of the things. If you just if you just couldn't do the drugs outside, then people would have a very different set of questions to answer for themselves in their lives, like where they want to sleep. How did the drug Let problem me... get to be this way? In brief, I know that's a massive question, but like like what exactly was there a specific time when sh when San Francisco really changed its approach mm -hmm. to policing or to prosecuting these types of crimes? I think it's been bad for a long time, longer than any of us have been. I mean, the 80s was also really bad. It was different kinds of drugs, but it was bad. It was, if you read this great book, um, Season of the Witch, it's the history of San Francisco. And just mm. by the decade, it's it's always been a kind of it's gritty. dark, always. gritty yeah. place. It's not like um, this idea that San Francisco was lost to like these crazy policies that happened recently. It's really not true. It's It, it should be amazing. For sure. And you don't need to justify yeah, that. has always kind of delighted me because I think it does have this interesting duality of like there's a dark underbelly coupled with extreme wealth. And it's kind of like, you know, this is the land of like the Getty family and their glorious yeah. mansion. And it's also the land of like, you know, complete flop houses. Um, and it's been I mean, you look at like the 50s and 60s in San Francisco and it's the very much the same story. Well, that's the I think mean, that's increasingly true of all of our huge cities. Um, certainly New York is like I mean, who can afford rent in New York City now? What is it? Like, I mean, if we're talking, you have a place where only billionaires and actual impoverished drug addicts can afford to live. And that's the same in San Francisco. That's the same in LA. That's the same in New York. And that's because of this thing where we really believe that 
there is some sort of human right to live in the most expensive cities in the world. And so we create these, I don't know what the flop houses of like, you know, the early 1900s were like, but today these are all things that we have created um, in the name really of a kind of charity. And yeah. uh, and what that does, it removes housing from the market. Uh, that They're sort of concurrently also freezing the building of new housing. So there's no new housing. So there's a super, super limited supply. And a lot of it goes to people who are net takers in the city. And that just, I mean, we, not you guys, this is a fucking libertarian podcast, but in ge generally speaking, uh, people look at the bifurcation of this, like billionaires and totally impoverished drug addicts. And they think like, oh, well, clearly the billionaires are doing something wrong. The rich people are doing something wrong. The government is doing something wrong. The government has created this bifurcated right. system where the middle class can't afford to live. And it has all of these crazy other effects, not just like, can we not afford to like, or new young people cannot afford to move to a city, but like the police officers who are policing your city are not of your community. The firefighters, the nurses, the teachers, they don't, they are all living, they're commuting into this right. place that is totally divorced from their, from, from them in terms of their community and their culture. And it just creates this like very unhealthy culture. No. In, in, in and then like the, the only, uh, acceptable political solutions are to give away low income housing or uh cap you know rent control and uh it can never be you know add a fifth or sixth story in the mission district right. like that right. so this is paris. yeah so when you look at paris every it's like seven story buildings everywhere and it's the first story it's first floor is shops and and it's like oh it's just uh what is it com what is it uh commerce not with zoning for Anyway, stores. Like mixed fun. use, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's like fun, like commercial, like yeah. bars, Rest restaurants, shops, and then six stories of housing. Every building, beautiful, right. and it all is like that. And in San Francisco, why is it not that? I was in New York. Even parts of New York are not like that. There, I mean, obviously, there are skyscrapers in New York, but there are neighborhoods yeah. like in the village. Like, wh why is it that the village should be seven stories tall? Everything should be seven stories, what? huge buildings, like density, yeah. beautiful. Can't ruin the character, man. I know it's like does Paris not have character. <laughs> I mean, yeah. come on, it's Paris. Yeah, like I'm not even yeah. I'm not asking for something crazy. I'm not asking for like brutalist socialist, uh, <laughs> you know, USSR style buildings here. I'm like, yeah. let's just start with Paris and then innovate yeah. from there. They've already done a lot. We can do more. I feel like I'm gonna get roasted for my Paris obsession now. But I think the French are really, in a lot of ways, it's just we beat up this on them a, a lot. Francophile podcast. There now. are some things they um, get right. Yeah. Mike yeah. loves so, um, PR. That's going to be the headline. Yeah. So, you know, in, in your uh, opening statement there, you are, it sounds like you're saying that you know, the answer to our question, can San Francisco be saved, is you think that it can, mm -hmm. and it's already sure. starting to turn around. It's so small. I wanna, yeah. I, I, well, I want to pull up, I want to pull up some of the data just so people have an understanding mm -hmm. of where. So, you know, th this, some of this is a little bit dated because like I have stuff from 2022, so it might have even been improved since then. But uh, this is the, these two uh, graphs are of the property and violent crime in the city. And it comes from uh, all of our links are in the description, but it comes from uh, basically the sites that you would go to uh, if you're looking to move somewhere, area vibes or neighborhood scout, which uh, visualize the data from, uh, you know, FBI sources. And so you can see San Francisco here, property crime per thousand residents compared to California as a whole, um, more than double, uh, much higher than the national median. Uh, this is uh, another way to look at it. Uh, burglary. Uh, much higher than the national and California average. Uh, actually, looks like three times as high as the national average. Uh, theft, uh, vehicle theft. Uh, you know, I, I was I was in San Francisco uh, a couple weekends ago and riding from the airport uh, on the little tram, and they make announcements on the tram, like on the way to the rental car center. You know, remove everything from the car because it will yeah. get broken into it if you don't. So that that's one of the things that famously plagues San Francisco. Um, and then we were talking about homelessness. You can see San Francisco um, has 800, as of 2022, this is from their homelessness count, uh, 887 homeless per 100,000 residents, which is, uh, it's, the, it's in the top three for California cities. 
Oakland and LA are above it. And then um, people experiencing homelessness per 100,000 oh, residents. What is this sheltered versus Orwellian unsheltered. language, Zach? <laughs> um, but th- this is really the, the the one that you know make, makes this makes cities unlivable for people is the unsheltered homeless population. Fifty seven percent of homeless <laughs> people in San Francisco are unsheltered. Um, right. New York has a much larger homeless population than any city in California, but most of them are sure. sheltered. Yeah. So the, the this is where the question always arises. Why can't something be done about that here when a city like New York is able to handle a, a much larger problem? And one of the answers seems to be that something can be done about it because Gavin Newsom cleaned up California's, uh, San Francisco's streets oh. right before Chinese President Xi Jinping came to visit. And we have a clip of him explaining how and why that happened. Can you roll that clip, John? I know folks say, oh, they're just cleaning up this place because all those fancy leaders are coming into town. Um, that's true <laughs> because it's true. But it's also true for months and months and months prior to APEC, We've been having different conversations and we've raised the bar of expectation between the city, the county and the state. Lots of conversations, raising expectations. Uh, how does that make you feel as a former San Francisco resident? And it's crazy. It would have made me enraged a few years ago, but now I'm numb to it. It's just funny to yeah. me because like that's who he is. These clowns who are running the city and the state. And um, of course they can do it and they won't. And a, lo- a lot of it is just the ideological makeup of their base. Um, um, one is what also California versus New York or something. It's like weather is a big part of this too. If you have homeless people unsheltered, it doesn't matter yeah. for whatever reason in New York in the winter, they're going to die. And so you kind of, you have no choice but to solve that problem here. You, you kind of have the liberty to be super leftist and crazy about like, Drugs should be legalized. People outside should be, you know, legally taking, you know, fentanyl or something. And we can wait for one bedroom apartments for these people. Um, so that's what Gavin Newsom is doing there is it's like he obviously he had to clean it up for for China for a second, but he he's not and he's now voicing these concerns. He's like, we're probably listen, we're gonna be better for, for the moderates who are increasingly loud. But at the end of the day, his party is going to be motivated by the people who are out there campaigning for them. And they have this weird sort of brain virus um, that leads them to do really self-destructive things and to embrace self-destructive policies that I think, despite how bad it seems, there's just people are allowed. You've probably noticed this, right? Even online, right? Like just it's people are at liberty to express reasonable opinions right now. (laughs) And they've been using those to put a lot of pressure on people like Gavin Newsom. I mean, he got absolutely roasted for that. It wasn't like um, he was ignored for it. I was right. out there attacking him for it and everyone was laughing. He was viraled into outer, he was uh, like sort of roasted into outer space. He went super viral. It was all negative commentary from everyone. There was no one who defended him. Um, so I think that, I think that that alone, like changing the sort of social expectations is helpful. Um, he still has this problem of his base who wants him to to keep the problem sort of going. Uh, but maybe I'm just, I don't know why I'm feeling off. Maybe I'm just tired of being pessimistic. And so I'm like being optimistic again. But I do, I do feel that no. things are a little bit better today on that the, front. I mean, you are, you are just empirically correct that there has been a turnaround. Um, th- these are the violent crime and property crime mm-hmm. statistics over time. And that red line I drew on there is after the pandemic, mm-hmm. property crime dropped because yeah. of people not just being in their houses. But then there was that spike uh, and it sort of started to go down uh, again. There's been some spikes in there. Um, again, th- these like light blue lines up here are the larceny theft. That seems to be really what is plaguing San Francisco at this point are these petty oh, crimes. Closer. So that's the yeah. thing. What really freaked every the reason that the crime narrative turned around in San Francisco was <laughs> because of the light blue line that spikes in 2020 does not plummet. It goes burglary. So what mm-hmm. happens is all of the car breakers go down. Yeah. Not because of people are home, 
Uh, so uh, auto thefts are like, actually this says that they're going up as well, but that can't be tr true because <laughs> from what I know, auto theft went down because tourists start, stopped coming to the city for a brief period of time. Yeah. Uh, the all of, all of the car burglars in San Francisco are run by an organized group of people who they steal shit and they sell it. A lot of times you see it on the street, but it's this is there was a lot of reporting and even the Chronicle on this. Um, it's an organized crime syndicate. That Hold plummet, on, got, I think I've got this. This might be more helpful, by the way. This has the actual percentage decrease from this year. This is from this year uh, compared to last year. So this is 2024 um, so, or something. So I'm, I'm going back yeah. to the COVID really quick yeah. and how the narrative yep, yep, yeah. changed. Sure. Absolutely. So when the go. goes down, all of those organized criminals have to do something. They turn to houses, home invasion. And Ooh. while the numbers are still, I guess, you know, that looks smaller than larceny theft, uh, the idea of having a person in your house is horrifying to everybody. And yeah. uh, San Francisco, while historically is a pretty low violent crime, even though burglary is not necessarily violent, it feels really fucking violent. And so people oh, yeah. lost their minds. And that's what switched the whole narrative on it is people suddenly, not only were they being broken in themselves, but everyone knew someone who had their house burglarized, actually like a person mm -hmm. in their house while they were there or something, uh, or their garage or something. And I, I think that's where where things definitely changed. And now there's just lower- there's something, there's something that must be so horrible about you know, why do I pay five fucking thousand yeah. dollars in rent every month in order to then have such a a fundamental thing, my ability to feel safe and comfortable in my own home violated? Um, I, I imagine yeah. it feels a little bit like, you know, it. why do I pay so much to not only feel so poor in San Francisco to have my money not go that far, but then also to know that I can't really um, be assured that my possessions will be safe, whether that's my home or my car, right? At least, at least for me, because I, I grapple with some of these same things as a New Yorker, there's a little bit of this idea of like, well, wait a second, this this feels like a bad deal. I work mm -hmm. awfully hard and I pay an awful lot of money in rent and I pay an awful lot of money every time I leave my house or go to a restaurant in order to have so little peace of mind, right? Like there's something very awful about stepping over, um, you know, a limp life, seemingly lifeless, uh, but really just passed out from addiction body when you're trying to swipe into the subway system. And it's a little bit like, wow, I pay a lot of money in rent and yet this is what is very standard to me. And that's really not how people in most other parts of the country live. Yeah. Or the Western world. I mean, if you look at any other major beautiful city yeah. in even Europe, and they, again, these pl these places definitely have problems, but why not these problems? So we know that they're solvable yeah. problems. And yeah, also, and, uh, I think, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to, you know, further validate your feeling that things have turned around in the very recently, um, th these were the stats from, as I mentioned earlier, this year. So this is, you know, from beginning of this year to where we are now, mid-year, compared to that same period last year. Almost every category, there's been a decrease. Um, and then clearance rates, uh, the uh, gold lines are last year, the blue lines are, sorry, the gold lines are this year. The blue lines are last year. So on some of many of these categories, I'm clearance so. rates have slightly go up, but the, the clearance rates actually are still pathetically low, which is another thing I wanted to ask you about, because it's like, what is wrong with SFPD? Like, why are they so bad at solving crimes, uh, even though their budget compared to many other police departments is much higher and they are fairly well staffed. Well, first I would say I want to contextualize those numbers a little bit and say two things are happening. One, a lot of people don't report crime in the city and that's gotten to be a mm. pervasive problem because nothing is done about it. Um, especially like things like car break-ins are almost never reported anymore. People just call the city. <laughs> a lot of competing services that come to your car, vacuum everything up, fix your window and off you go. Um, well, do we two. have this? No, well, hold on. So that's an interesting thing to me because I had my when I lived in Austin a few years back, I had my car broken into and I I didn't report it to the police because you call it and what it's going to take them twelve hours to show up. What does it matter? APD yeah. was understaffed. Okay, so instead we just take the car to the shop, get it cleaned up. Okay, we pay three hundred bucks or whatever the amount is, and it's like so that that never gets logged as a crime that is happening, even though it did happen. No. And so one thing that I'm curious about, and and I don't I don't know about this, but is one of the reasons why 2023, 2024, it looks like a lot of these crime categories have improved in most major cities around the US 
is part of the reason because people got so desensitized to crime over the course of the pandemic that now they've sort of thrown up their hands with a lot of categories, maybe rape and homicide or exceptions. But they say, eh, fuck it. My car got broken into. OK, well, there's no use in reporting it because I know nothing is going to be done. And so are we actually just not measuring it? Yeah, certainly that happens at Walgreens as well. They're not calling the cops and reporting the people who are packing their trash bags with items, which has gotten yeah. worse and worse and worse. And these are where like you you have these, the, the numbers are telling you something, but also, I mean, I go to the drugstore and it's all locked now and I've watched, I mean, yeah. I, you see people stealing shit almost every time you go in and the staff is trained not to do anything about it, not to call the cops, not to try and stop them, just to let them out. Um, yeah. And you think, okay, well, I think the numbers are off there. And then two, all of downtown has been gutted since uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. All of the tech companies are gone because everything, a lot of reasons. One, the rent was extremely high. So to pay that kind of rent to live there for the what you were saying, Liz, it's like a lot of people made that choice. They were like, well, why would I pay all this and deal with people shitting in the street and crime and yeah. the cops don't care and no one cares, nothing's going to change. So, so a lot of people left. The downtown. So now it's just like hollow Downtown out. collapse. So it's a, it's a ghost town. There are less people to rob down there. And the people who are left are less likely to report the crime. I'm not yeah. sure what tourism looks like, but certainly for like 2020, 2021, it was way, way, way down, uh, which means that, again, like you just have less people to do crime against. And uh, yeah. and that would affect the rates as well, because it's you, you're right. at a higher concentration of people in a, in a spot that's now dispersed. So I think it's, it's harder to maybe do crime yeah. in the city. Uh, and on the cop side, that is part of it demoralization because people, you know, you arrest someone and then they get freed or whatever. Then you have a prosecutor who's come in, who's actually prosecuting, and uh, which is what we have in the city now, or at least doing some of it. Um, for example, famously, all of the bridge protesters on the Bay, not the most recent one, there was oh, one yeah. right before it, um, <laughs> they were being charged with, I believe it was false imprisonment. And the case was just thrown out. So the, the, the DA tried to prosecute, you know, they all got arrested, DA prosecuted, the judges threw it out. We have crazy, crazy, crazy pro-crime judges in San Francisco who are voted in and never leave. And there's not much you can do. And then part, I don't know, at some point you had to start blaming the cops as well. It's like, okay, but well, where are you? Why aren't you doing this? And they got a free press for a while because yeah. there was no prosecution, but now there's prosecution. The judges still suck, but what's going on? I don't know. Maybe corruption. Maybe it's the thing that I was telling, saying earlier where they just don't feel like they're a part of this community. So why does it matter to them as much? But certainly, I agree with you. It's a problem. They are paid a lot, and uh, and it's not working. Whatever they're doing yeah. is not working. The, this is from a study of the San Francisco Police Department, which we can link as well. Uh, but it shows that the, despite uh, this is from over the decade, from 2010, 11 through 2020, 20, 21, police budget per resident up seven percent. Police employees per resident up twelve yeah. percent. Reported crimes per resident up 19%. Police arrests per reported offense down 60%. Wow. Crime solved by police down 33%. This seems to be a long standing problem. So yeah. crime um, increased as police got way worse at actually investigating and solving the crimes. It's also just mentioned that you all, or San Francisco residents, uh, as of this study, were averaging. Seven hundred four dollars per resident for police services, which looks higher than every other l large city. So, paying more, getting less. Uh, With the, the exception of Los Angeles, story. worth noting. Uh, no, I think it was wasn't uh, L.A. Was, oh yeah, you're right, seven fifty eight. So yes, yeah, that's uh, that that tracks. Um, you, you mentioned um, at the top that. Uh, school boards have been a bright spot. Uh, all these, uh, there's Always been the some... bright spot. Okay, but... tell tell me more about what's transpired. Two very with... crazy people were board. removed, but the boards are still okay. stuck. And the okay. schools still suck. Everything. The schools suck. The what's, transportation so, sucks. Yeah. What's been happening? What's been happening with the schools? Give me the. Say, I were like a, a sweet little mom trying to move to San Francisco. I'm absolutely not. But like, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to send my kid to San Francisco public schools. What would you tell me? I was going to write myself a note really quick. Okay. So I would say uh, you better be really rich because you're going to want to send your kids to private school, which is what everybody here does, even when they can't afford it because the schools are that bad. And a big part of that problem is the lottery thing. So you actually, yep. as a mom, can't predict where your kid's going to go to school because um, your kid, in the name of equity, or they had some other word for it back when the lottery was in place, um, were first put in place. 
uh, this idea that no kid, depending on where their neighborhood is, should have to go to that bad school, wherever that is. It doesn't matter that every single school gets the same amount of money per kid. Mm -hmm. Schools are bad in poorer areas and better in richer areas. And that has a lot to do, I think, with the kind of people who go to those schools. You have usually parents at home. It's They tend to be more stable homes. Um, but whatever, that's a whole other story. Parents who are invested will hold teachers accountable. Yes. Student, yeah, where you know yeah. that the behavioral problems will be dealt with, not just in a school environment, but also at home. Like, so, you know, generally speaking, involved, wealthier parents are not going to tolerate uh, awful behavior from a kid. Yes. That's when you And so there's a misconception that those schools have more money per kid. They don't. It's just yeah. they have parents that are way more invested. My dad taught in a very poor school growing up, and he, yeah. um, he would go to parent teachers' night and at late at night and zero people would zero for years zero parents would show up um that is completely the opposite of my middle class school that i went to where every parent showed up and then i've talked to this usually rich liberals before and they're like well that's because everybody in that town was working night shifts and it's like oh my god like we really have to get rid of these delusions here it's like these that's not what's happening that is they're not working night shifts uh you have a lot of people on welfare in these rage in, in in these places you have a lot of people who just don't care about their kids education and for whatever reason we, i want to i want to push back on that like how do you know how do you know it's not due to like uh how do you, you know, know that not every years? single person in the town is working Maybe night not every shift? single but like on average i mean like it's i don't work a night shift right like because I, I work a knowledge worker laptop job, right? Like I have infinite flexibility in my schedule to be able to go attend a parent teacher conference, which I would sooner shoot myself than attend a parent teacher conference, at least at the stage I'm at right now. Like, my God. But like, how, how can we say for sure that it's due to this like apathy versus due to legitimately like, I don't know, single parent households or people who don't have work flexibility or, um, you know, I, I would imagine it's probably a mixture of these things, right? Some people are really checked out and just shitty parents and other people probably have all of these constraints that are affecting how much of themselves they can devote to their kids' education, no? I think... I could be wrong. Convince me I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I think that we need... I'm happy to look at the data here. Mm -hmm. um, there is... I am really... Con I would bet... I would actually... If the betting markets were open, I would bet <laughs> thousands of dollars right now <laughs> on whatever <laughs> you want to give me that not even one parent was working a night shift. Because okay. this is like, I mean, my dad's working in a place where kids are bringing guns to school. It's like yep. very crazy kind of place. Broken homes, welfare right. everywhere. Like it's not good. And yeah. it doesn't matter how much the schools get because there's no support at home is, is my higher level thing. Um, so because of that in San Francisco, and let's go, I would love to like, let's revisit the, but I yeah. did. I don't, I, I'm talking, it's something, I, this is just an anecdote I, for me. Yeah, I don't, don't want to like get too hung up on it, but it is definitely something that's on my mind because I used to live in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn for a, a while. And it was very much something that was interesting to me because it felt like there were lots and lots of families where parents were just legitimately kind of awful um, and super checked out. And then there were other families where it's like, well, I can I can see how on the outside it would look as if you're checked out and not invested. But in reality, I see a lot of the, I don't know, I would chat with my neighbors a lot and it felt like there was a little bit of texture as to, you know, a, a pretty wide range, a lot of high variance in terms of these situations. Um, that dissuades me from painting with too broad of a brush but also at the same time like if the outcome isn't there the outcome being kids who actually behave teachers who hold them accountable some amount of checks and balances um to ensure that schools are functioning as they ought to if the outcomes aren't there okay well how much do the inputs matter i don't know this this um <laughs> backlash that is happening um that you are a part of what's <laughs> what's there's a the thing that people wonder is what do you want exactly like oh, what, I have a, what it I have a uh, list. And, and yeah and um it, you know i want to bring up uh the way that that question is presented in the media um this is new york Times. <laughs> yeah they hate gary gary, gary. tan <laughs> um uh, uh san francisco's twitter menace or true believer he might be both uh this is how uh tan uh Gary Tan is represented in the article. Uh, he's they note that he's spent four hundred thousand on local politics in the past few years. Um, says he is a moderate Democrat. Uh, wants three uh, three not exactly radical changes to San Francisco: a beefed up police force with more power to combat the city's property crime epidemic and anti Asian violence, a thriving public school district that pushes students academically. <laughs> and more housing for people of all income levels in a city struggling with tent encampments and a disappearing middle class. 
uh, Mr. Tan and his allies are often labeled right-wing know-it-alls. So what do the right, <laughs> is that basically the agenda of the right-wing know-it-alls? Well, I would quibble slightly with, I'm a little bit skeptical of the anti-Asian violence thing. I think that there's, there's a lot of violence, period. I don't know that there's like an Asian hate wave, hate crime wave ha happening. It certainly okay. happened. Like there are little old Asian people who get attacked. Um, yeah. There's a lot to that. There's there's like a violent story there. There's a, there's a, I don't even, you know what? It's just, these are new stories that we're working on actually at Pyrewires and I don't want to blow up sounds in this spot, but there's, there's context yeah. to that that's important. And then there's my own just like skepticism generally of a um, sort of identitarian argument like that. I think that mm -hmm. the problems are broad and affect everybody. Um, I don't think that that's like the, Asians are being uniquely targeted, but I will say that like those, then it, sorry, Liz, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say you're very much speaking the same um, language as reason. I mean, my our colleague Elizabeth Nolan Brown wrote a story for reason maybe three or four years ago at this point that was debunking some of the Asian anti-Asian hate crime uh, myth, basically saying like, look, you know, even with some things like, uh, you know, massage parlor, I think there's a massage parlor shooting a few years back. You know, we don't really necessarily have enough evidence to indicate that it was um, something that was motivated by racial animus. And so coding it as such and then concocting this sort of fear based narrative that basically tells Asian Americans that um, there's bogeymen hiding behind every corner. Like yeah. we should actually be very skeptical of that. Um, and so it's tough because and it's, we're seeing a little bit of this also with some of the um, concern about like anti-Semitic hate crimes right now. I, I too kind of get yes. a little bit suspicious of like, OK, well, how careful are we actually being with assessing whether there are these waves that these specific demographic groups ought to be afraid of? Like I'm I'm not so sure always. Yeah. And in this case, it's very difficult because we want the same things, or at least I certainly want the same things as the people who are talking about the stop Asian hate thing in San Francisco. Um, but clearly, to my mind, what's happening is an attempt to uh, stir up hmm. an identity based grievance that would galvanize yeah. the Asian American community into voting for way more moderate uh, pro police anti crime candidates. But and it's like I I want more anti-crime candidates, but I'm not going to pretend that the identity stuff isn't anything other than, in my opinion, very toxic and divisive yeah. and bad for American culture. Like I believe in sort yeah. of like American identity. We fuck the racism stuff. Like I just, I, I want to talk about it really soberly. Sometimes racism happens and, but I need evidence for that. Um, and then we, you could you correct for it. But then I would say with Gary, like I agree with the goals roughly. I think they're super broad and that's, uh th that's, and the reason that's a problem is because the progressives would say they also want those things. But well, let's just drill down on something like school, for example. Yeah. Like, One you second, want better. Because I realized that I didn't uh, even introduce who Gary Tan is. He's the CEO yeah, of but, Y Combinator, um, well, very successful venture capitalist. Um, but uh, continue. Uh, just wanted to get and that. Gary's, so Gary Lover is. Lover of Wu Tang Clan and many yeah. other hip hop groups. Uh, notorious. Yes, and, and very now politically active, uh, has kind very of become yes. the, the face of let's turn the San Francisco thing around movement. So, so. Yes. Yeah. And importantly, he's also, he runs Y Combinator, which is a huge deal in tech, yeah. not only in terms of creating great companies, but it's a status thing. So lots of people in tech look up to Gary. And so to have him be a voice of reason and not even just a voice of reason, but a sort of dog, like a, uh, what is it? A, a doggedly pro progress voice of reason. He's relentless. He's fighting. He's not going to stop. He's not going to back down. He's putting money into it. He's getting people, other people involved. That's really important. Um, yeah. And he's awesome. And I, I agree with all of his broad um, categories there. The the difficulty becomes like the progressive, the, I got to stop calling them progressives, the left wing, <laughs> sort of the regressive left, let's call it. Yeah. Um, they want the same, they, they want the same things. And on housing, it's like, yeah, we want great public education. But <laughs> what you have to do, and here's where we disagree, is like you have to abolish the lottery system. Uh -huh. It's fucked up. And it means that you can't opt into no. neighborhoods and make a choice for your own kid's future. The, when you get when you have a lottery like that, it means the only person who's entitled to <laughs> any degree of choice for their kids is a rich person who can send them to private school. And right. that's just not fair. And it's not, in my opinion, very progressive. Uh, so, so if you what are the fixes that you would propose? So so if you if you um, got to get out a red pen and edit Tan's proposal for fixing San Francisco, what would the Solana proposal be? Well, you definitely, and here's where Tan, I'm probably, I I'm pr I bet that Tan and I would agree on everything. It's just like maybe some of these things yeah. aren't being verbalized, but I think they have to be verbalized. 
so we can fight for them. I don't want to speak for him, so I'm not saying for sure he agrees with me, but <laughs> my proposals would be uh, mm -hmm. abolish the lottery system. Um, you replace it with what? Do what instead? You go to the school that's in your neighborhood, period. Perfect. And every school gets the same amount of money. And and it's like per every student, every school in San Francisco gets the same amount of money per student in that school. Um, all the teachers are sort of, I don't, and from there, I don't know, I'm not going to, but it's, so there's no, so you're, ta you're taking away uh, school choice in this regard. In what way? Um, no, no, no. We don't have school. Uh, there's no school choice now. Okay. Okay. What, yeah. what no, no, is, I'm saying that, yeah. I'm saying you can make a choice on where to live. And then you, that's yeah. my parents did that. My parents thought about the school system before they uh, moved to our our uh, our home. They checked it out. Is it good? Or, or, or yeah. That's a choice, in my opinion. Okay. And then there's more was, choice that you can add. So okay. the, the, I guess the, I was the, confused by the, the introduction of the lottery system because I think of that as associated with... No, no, no. Abolish uh, the lottery system. I think that we should abolish... With How the lottery you... system as it well on, so uh, with the lottery system as it currently exists, the way that it exists in New York is that you essentially get to rank order choice um, your your school preferences, but it's basically very randomly assigned, especially at the lower levels. There are some magnet schools that you can sort of test into later on, but generally speaking, like there's a lot of randomness um, in the process. How does it work in San Francisco? It's a t it's a total everyone yeah you you say what you you want don't get to rate order anything yeah at all. you say you say what schools you want to go in all throughout the city and then there's a roll of the dice and yeah, you almost never get what you want similar and to New so York yeah. it's like that's a that's not choice at all the choice is like yeah. you move to the neighborhood where your school is and you're a part of that community and you work really hard to make it great and that's that's one version the next version of choice is like you test really well and you make sure that you have schools where when you test really well, you can go to the better schools. So we have yeah. a, a, a school for a merit-based school. We have one, Lowell. It's constantly the battleground now for ideological warfare. It's the last one. There used to be more. And um, <laughs> so it's like one, you have a baseline. You go to the school where you move to and you're a part of that community and you sort of work to make it better or it fails. And uh, then two, you allow for merit-based sorting. And you allow kids who are doing really well to go into a the the merit the advanced placement sort of merit based, sort of not advanced placement I'm sorry it's sort of like middle school and then uh, yeah. high school sort of advanced placement classes or advanced placement schools and and that can be and will be for, from all over the city that's what Lowell is and, and was it's like yeah you could be anywhere in the city it doesn't matter if you're near it or not it's just like if you test into it you test into it but testing into it is also a choice to me. That's like you're choosing every day to study and do well. And if you do, you have an option to, to go into this other other place. How else okay. would you pick San Francisco yeah. beyond the schools? And that's just beginning with the schools, right? I'm not even in education. Yeah. Like, there are a million things you could do in terms of the, the curriculum, like get rid of the woke yeah. shit. And I mean, they focus on things like naming, yeah, renaming that. school buildings and whatnot. But that's, you know, table that. Yeah. Um, on homelessness, you have to strip all of the nonprofits of funding. So there's something like 80 something of them that get money from the city to ameliorate one piece of homelessness. None of mm -hmm. them get money. All of them are defunded. That solves a lot of problems. One that solves the problem of deranged people living off of the government and voting for those same policies. So goodbye, like you can get another job that's productive or you can leave the city. Um, mm -hmm. but now you have a lot of money to do something uh, in the city. You have to use that money to build emergency shelter that is not downtown where all the drug dealers are. And you provide just beds, clean beds, showers, nursing staff, um, food, and you have an emergency setup where someone's really down on, on their luck. You know, San Francisco, you're never gonna, I know the libertarians may disagree on this. In San Francisco, you're there's no one's gonna ever accept nothing in terms of welfare for the absolute, you know, most yeah. impoverished. So you have to have something. And I think that the solution is just something we can afford, which is the bare bones thing on the outskirts of town that's very safe, very clean, very well policed. Um, and if you are so out of luck that you have nothing, you have you will always have shelter. And uh, we have to be zero tolerance policy for fentanyl dealers, especially when they're from foreign countries. We have Hondurans are we have a crazy Honduran crime syndicate that is selling tons of fentanyl in the city. We can't even get them to, they're illegally, they're illegal immigrants. They can't, we can't even get them deported, well, um, let alone put in jail. So zero tolerance for that kind of shit and emergency shelter and no more sleeping in tents downtown um, in the little drug shops. Sorry, it's not happening. Um, those are the things that I would do.
and they would have an immediate, I think an immediate effect on the city in terms of just one stability for parents who can now plan ahead for their kids. They know where their kids are going to be going to school. They know it's going to be a good school or, or, or whatever. They can sort of plan their lives around that. They don't have to worry about the drugs and no one has to worry about uh, the homelessness problem anymore, either the homeless people or the people around them. So, I, so the the drugs issue is the one where, as a libertarian, I always get concerned or, with these conversations because um, we talk about law and order, which is good, but then um, experiments in harm reduction and drug decriminalization, I think, sometimes get lumped into that uh, and like san francisco i think gets wrongly held up as the example of like yeah. this is what happens if you do drug decriminalization um why like, wrongly how, how, well because um there's other places that have done drug decriminalization but also not allowed a free-for-all on the streets you oh know, right the, yes in yes. europe um yeah G germany famously is the place where i think uh, lesbian also which was like that? Portugal. Portugal is or, Germany, Portugal yeah. is like one model, but Ger Germany yep. um, kind of do, did has done a bunch of harm reduction measures, not outright decriminalization like Portugal, and um, you know it hasn't turned into San Francisco across the country. In fact, their drug use rates well, are kind of below average for Europe. Uh, so it, it it doesn't follow. My point is, it doesn't follow for me that. Drug, drug decriminalization or like cle uh, safe consumption spaces and things like this are the problem. It's more of a like allowing anything to go on the streets in sidewalks. But what what is your what is your attitude towards drug use and tolerance of drugs at this point? So I think it would be a great start to not being allowing it to, to, to not allowing it outside as, as you see throughout Europe. And that's always what, you know, like it's, that's a conversation that happens a lot in San Francisco is right. just, you know, this is, you're saying we're doing this policy, but it's not at all how it's run abroad where it, it actually, you say works. All the data supporting this stuff is, is pointing to places where things are done completely differently. Right. Um, I do not think illegal immigrants should be allowed to hop the border and sell fentanyl to drug addicts in America. I just don't. And that is where I just maybe, this is actually like one of the issues that probably made me stop being a libertarian, honestly, is like, mm. I look at that and I don't care what the data says. I just know that that's wrong and I'm not tolerating it. I like I, I have zero tolerance for it. Um, I have mm -hmm. way more empathy for drug addicts. I understand addiction. Um, I have no empathy at all for drug dealers, specifically yeah, I mean, drug dealers dealing fentanyl. Yeah. I mean, what what to do about fentanyl is one question. Where fentanyl came from and why it's yeah, flooding our agree. streets is another problem that I, I think you can make a pretty strong case was a direct result of drug prohibition because essentially the black market made it much more efficient for fentanyl to get into the country, um, be generated in, in a lab and so forth. And if there was easier ways for people who wanted to get yes. opioids to get opioids, then this never would have happened. So I think we got to try to, you know, hold all well, these thoughts in our mind when we think honest, about solutions. Why did it start? It started because people did get opioids. It started because it was very yeah. easy to get opioids and a lot of people got addicted to them. Yeah. I, I, that is... There, I just don't believe yeah, this. People idea were yes, that... people were on painkillers, but and then uh, once they clamped down on the painkillers, they went to heroin, and then yes. once fentanyl came in and it was cheaper than heroin, they went to but fentanyl. The original so problem it... was the flood of easy to access opioids. Whenever you have more of a drug, do you think that marijuana use has gone down or up since it was legalized throughout California? Like, let's be honest about what happens when you legalize these things or to even decriminalize these things. And so there's a next, and with marijuana, it's like that's a relatively benign drug. It's not a big deal. But once you decriminalize opioid use and you have a lot of people on opioids, which by the way, most of them are fine, but like one out of a hundred seems to be totally fucking addicted immediately. And I, mm -hmm. that is something I'm super aware of. I have heroin addicts on my, like in my sort of extended family. And I myself have used legally hydrocodone for uh, uh, mouth surgery and uh -huh. 
dude, one week into it, I could feel the pull. And I knew that that, that for me was going to be extremely dangerous. And it, and it was that experience with that drug that built, I would say, some empathy for drug addicts, really for the first time ever, because I grew up sort of hating them due to my family background. And two, changed my perspective on these drugs specifically. It's like, yeah, most people are fine, but some people, it is really weird. It is like, you, you, for sure. I don't know how to predict it or what causes it, but that addiction is crazy. And um, it's it's just very strong for me. Like that yeah. was in that one week that it was stronger than, yeah, it was a stronger. But I, know, than, I, but I, well, I don't I to, really I, accept I the actually... idea that. I, well, I don't really accept the idea that um, legalizing it ne or makes necessarily makes it more prominent or more problematic. Yes, there's always a problematic uh, addictive population, but that's not what happened. To go to return to the Portugal example, they already had an addiction problem, and then they decriminalized and the uh, the uh, problematic use and the overdoses and the disease that came from IV use. Those all went down after that happened because they paired it with a robust treatment system. And so the libertarian argument is kind of like you can't get rid of the, the the human impulse to seek after that. What you can do is kind of treat it with a level of maturity and have um, actual, you know, open conversation and, and treatment options for people who unfortunately do fall prey to addictive behavior. Well, hold on. Could you, I, I would like to hear you, the two of you hash out the origins of vast fentanyl use and addiction in the United States. I mean, so it seems like you guys both agree there was a flooding of the market with like lots and lots of prescribing of opioids, right? Yeah. And then from there, so you had this, this population of people using opioids that ballooned. And then from there, some of those people started using heroin. And then from there, um, you know, it, fentanyl became the thing that the um, black market provided because it was cheaper to produce the and more potent, right? Um, and so, Zach, so so Mike, it's from there, so you guys agree on those facts, but then yeah. your views sort of diverge. I mean, so Mike, you're basically saying the population of people who are addicted has ballooned overall, and Zach, you're saying no, not necessarily. Um, no, I, I'm saying that, um, I, I'm agreeing with Mike that fentanyl is the, the problem that is what has driven the overdose epidemic. I'm pointing out that the, that fentanyl, the abundance of fentanyl is itself a product of the black product market. Work. And the uh -huh. way out of that is to get people to a safer supply instead of trying to fight a supply yeah. side fight. You are saying, I think you're addressing the overdose problem, and I'm interested in the addiction problem. I don't think there should be so many people addicted to opioids, period. And so my question is, how do I we agree. get to a world where this many people are, are not addicted to opioids? And I'm skeptical of a world where you can walk into a store and get whatever opioids you want. Um, I'm skeptical that that does not lead to a world of, not only skeptical, I just completely reject the notion that if it's easy to get opioids, more people aren't going to do them and more people aren't going to get addicted. And we actually, this has been tested out with this is how the opioid crisis happened. Um, I would be interested in the numbers on marijuana, which we like are easiest. I don't actually have them. I wasn't prepared to talk about this. Um, but I would be interested to know like how many people are smoking marijuana, um, you know, today versus 20 years ago across it's the definitely country. More. I believe it's like, I, like anecdotally, it seems like head, everybody. Three it seems time a number roughly. So like, let's be honest about what is a world where it's that easy to get op opioids look like? Let's say hydrocodone. What does that look like? It's a fucking good drug, let me tell you. So people mm -hmm. are going to take it and how many of them are going to get addicted? Like, that's very scary to me. I feel that way about also SSRIs. Like, um, the really easy to access uh xanax and things like this i it's just fine f that one um f doesn't do shit to me but like there are some people who can't handle it and um it's a non-trivial number of people so most people fine oh go ahead oh yeah no, I'm yeah i mean and, and, yeah again mo no, most, I was say the, that most, most drugs are this well yeah i was just to say mo most drugs are this way where there is an abusive population of uh, population of subset population of users who abuse the drugs and there has to be we have to cope with that we have to have the appropriate place for them to go to get
help with that. Um, I just but some number of them would of... really reject getting help in the first place, right? Like some number of them. This is kind of the the uh, yes, I mean, addict, right? Yeah. They're not in their rational, right thinking minds, and so it's very hard to actually get them to seek help and to sustain uh, their commitment to living a life that is free of yeah, these substances that don't work. It's only them. a recent development that uh, we've even tried that uh, as an alternative to just, you know, locking them up, letting them out, that there's more of a pathway. So you have to build that out. Um, but yeah, I, I know that neither of us came here prepared to do a full on <laughs> uh, drug decriminalization drug debate. debate. So I'd like to just broaden the, the, your critique of libertarianism a little bit as we bring the conversation to a close. Um, I saw an older episode that you did with Chris Rufo, um, who <laughs> I've also, I've clashed with him before a bit. Um, and you all were offering a critique of uh, reason style libertarianism and classical liberalism. I like to play a little bit of that critique and- Oh uh, God, I never have to deal with clips <laughs> of videos I did. I hope that it's not it's embarrassing. Like it's it's not embarrassing. Let's just uh, play it, and I'd like to expand on that critique a little bit. The one criticism that bothered me, this is our second camp of weird criticism, was from Reason Magazine, the libertarian magazine, which I like came up through politically. And they wrote a piece titled, Chris Rufo Became the Thing He Hates. And this is a kind of criticism you get from the sort of like reasonable right, the like thoughtful right wing, where we were going after wokeness in a way that was very thoughtful. It was like, we're better than them, but they lose. So what is it? What, are the, what does that matter? And I'm always, for, for in my own personal life, I find myself kind of torn between these two places where I recognize the, uh, the authoritarian tactics. And I'm also forced to recognize the fact that they are successful and the alternative is not winning. Look, um, for some reason, libertarians are criticizing me for uh, creating the political narrative and working with policymakers to abolish DEI bureaucracies in public universities. We're, we're eliminating a ideological uh, uh, department of the government. Uh, in theory, libertarians should be cheering this on. Libertarians, likewise, have been advocating uh, very ineffectively, despite putting uh, huge resources into uh, advocating school choice um, uh, uh, for decades now. Uh, and yet, uh, in recent years, if you talk to Doug Ducey, the governor of Arizona, the first governor to pass uh, universal school choice, if you talk to Ron DeSantis, if you talk to Governor Abbott, they'll tell you that my work on critical race theory and gender ideology in schools, exposing it, making parents aware of it, mobilizing parents at school board meetings, was essential for getting universal school choice this impossible goal uh, uh, for uh, libertarians. And so um, I, I would say two things. I, I'm not a libertarian, uh, but I am a better libertarian than many libertarians who criticize me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, what do you, uh, are you still in that headspace, Mike, where you're- Well, first I just want to say to on the school choice, which is I think yeah. I realize what you're talking about now. I'm, I'm in favor of all the charter school shit as well, on top of the sort of where you go yeah. to school thing. So just like, okay. I don't know. I don't want to be seen as like an anti-charter school person. Um, <laughs> I my I feel like libertarianism is uh, of all of the sort of fully baked, <laughs> fully sort of self. Um, what is it? It's like internally consistent. Yeah, it's is. like the only super internally consistent um, political oh, philosophy. Yeah. It's definitely my favorite. It's sort of, it feels like a true north. It's the thing that I hold myself up against when I'm doing or speaking about something or or defending something that's um i think important but not libertarian i don't know I, I think about it a lot libertarians do not win libertarians have never won um libertarians also require for most of their arguments to work the world to be libertarian and that's everything from the drug debate that we're having now to um specifically foreign policy is where i think it like really breaks down uh things like trade also um and i just have become I think it was especially during like 20, I mean, throughout the late teens, but like really COVID made this very clear to me that I just wanted things to work <laughs> and probably fundamentally the oh. difference is libertarianism, which would have to be hands off, laissez faire, everybody agrees it works, no. um, does not put forward a, 
a set of things that it would like to do to the world to change it. And I have a very specific idea of how the world could be better. And I think that nobody will ever win anything without a compelling vision for the future that is very specific. Um, and so I think that you have to kind of come with that, like the city, our city should look like this. Even earlier today, we were talking about public schools. Libertarians don't believe in the concept. Yeah. So it's sort of weird, like, to, to, like how libertarian are we really? Um, like at what degree of libertarianism are you? Well, yeah. How can we you may... say libertarians? Hold on. How can you say libertarians don't have wins? I mean, I can think of a ton of things in the last decade or so that have changed in the direction of libertarianism and in, in ways that libertarians have been on the ground advocating for. I mean, one of which is the you know vast acceptance and legalization and decriminalization in many places of marijuana. Um, we also see the beginning of um, that type of thing happening with psychedelics as well. We see some trials for ketamine as a means of helping veterans no. get past PTSD. These are all wins delivered. No, those are things that you like. Libertarians. Those are things that you like as a libertarian. Those are not things that libertarians did. That, that, libertarians those are all... have played a huge drug policy alliance and SSTP and all. Well, hold on. I want to I want to go through the list. Libertarians have played a big part in passing some of these reforms and in working on the ground to get these things passed. I mean, we've seen huge victories in school choice. Uh, we have, I believe, like Florida, Arizona, a whole bunch of states that are moving in this direction. Um, you look at the degree to which school of choice played a part in Virginia, and there's a little bit of this referendum on COVID lockdown policy. Again, libertarians have been advocating for these things at school choice specific organizations for a long time. Right. We see qualified immunity rollbacks um, and certain changes to policing practices that, again, are things libertarians have been advocating for. I mean, we see, I, even though it's stupid, and seen as really like, you know, trivial occupational licensing schemes. Libertarians are sort of like institute for justice lawyers are the ones who are focused on rolling back some of these things that are really onerous toward entrepreneurs, especially poor minority entrepreneurs. I mean, you look at sort of the success of the YIMBY movement, which I know YIMBYs are sort of a, coal a coalition of some libertarians and some progressives, right? But you look at the degree to which YIMBYs have actually had some major policy successes. I'm looking at like the Austin housing market and the degree to which home prices have actually really cooled. And it seems like they're actually beginning to take more of the Sunbelt trajectory than the California one, right? Like Austin has decided to follow Sunbelt steps, not become LA and San Francisco-ified, right? How can you look at these things and say that libertarians, that these ideas don't work or that libertarians don't have concrete policy wins? Because those are all specific things that libertarians agree with, not libertarianism. Libertarianism is, is the, it is, it would require a real absence of authority in most aspects of our lives. And if all of that happened at once, you'd have perhaps, you know, theoretically, a world that I would be very excited about. But in a world where you get like libertarianism on illegal immigration, but not libertarianism on social welfare, that's a much worse version of social welfare. And that is my problem with like these things, even if I don't- I agree I, well, with that. I agree with the critique that you're making there, right? I live in New York where- we're saying our city coffer is depleted by the day because we've decided, oh, we'll just do free shelter for all and let in anybody who wants it, including a bunch of illegal immigrants. And it's like, well, that's my money that I paid as a taxpayer that's being spent on these people. You can't have one without the other. That simply does not work. But the claim that you're making is more specific than that, though, I think, which is that libertarians never win. We do win. Maybe it's not the areas that you no, want I, I, us to win in. But like oh, no. school choice is a big win. I, like rolling back the war on drugs, occupational licensing, qualified immunity. All these things are big wins to me. I think that, so I agree that libertarians are like those things. I just don't think that that's a win for libertarianism. I think that's a thing that like either liberals or conservatives like, and when it's this hodgepodge system, that's just not libertarianism. Right. You're not, you're not forwarding libertarianism in, in America. You're forwarding, honestly, the things that we're talking about other than school choice. Uh, so like the drug thing, all the immigration stuff, the, this whole fucking immigration. Well, immigration, I don't feel like anything, hold on. I don't think any progress has been made on the immigration front. Simply having utter chaos at the border and a totally batshit system of asylum seeking where people can't get work authorization and can't actually like, you know, make a living for themselves. Like this is not a libertarian win. I don't see anything that's happening at the border simply because more illegal immigrants are in the country during the Biden years than before does not mean that we moved the needle in a libertarian direction on immigration. To me, what would be a libertarian direction on immigration would be if we 
um, you know, 4X the number of uh, H-1B visas that we allowed, but we haven't done stuff well, like that, right? Those are the be... actual serious policy making no, 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 things no. that we choose to abdicate Come on. on. That wouldn't be libertarianism. That would be a smart policy for immigration. That would not be amnesty <laughs> for 10 million immigrants, which I'm sure a lot of your libertarian friends would want. All illegal immigrants here get amnesty immediately. I think open, straight up open borders is a libertarian. I was an open borders libertarian when I was a wee lad first learning about all this stuff i was super super committed to it but because it, but, it only makes sense if you have every other aspect of liber libertarianism in place and you never will so you, i think you have to fight for something that is sorry go ahead well i i just i think it's a little bit dishonest to say that the situation that we have right now is what libertarians want at the point no, i don't think that right like I I, yeah okay i don't think that okay Mike, because I mean, I right ask... now we essentially have a really frustrating situation where so many people are coming in. It's done in a terribly disorganized manner. We don't have any sort of political will that really consents this and agrees that this is the right approach. And then we also have a ton of these asylum seekers and recent newcomers who are waiting on authorization from the federal government to work. So they're just essentially being forced to be these like wards of the state in a way that I don't no. think most people want. Maybe progressives want that, but like I think most conservatives and libertarians don't want that. And I think the actual migrants themselves probably don't want well, this here's either. Here's what I want. I want to provide them a bus ticket home. And that is what I want. And it's not a libertarian position. <laughs> it's and, not very libertarian. And I, I and that is and the reason I want that is because I don't think we're ever going to live in a libertarian world where this new group of immigrants is not going to be plugged into our social welfare system for the rest of their lives. Like this entrance is crazy. Like my grandma was an immigrant. That's it was a very different kind of immigration in the 20 or early I 20th century. I hear that. I hear that line of argument all the time. And like, I think it's fair to say we don't want people to become, you know, charges of the state for years and years on end. But I don't know if we necessarily have the evidence. And maybe this is like the annoying nitpickiness of libertarians coming through. But I don't know if we have the evidence to say that, you know, these ones were made different than immigrants of what 30 or 40 years ago, I know that years ago. their whole entrance has been drains on the state, straight up like living in government funded housing, being given government funded supplies. Like that's the, that's the, how that is our relationship with this new group of people. And I and think and I, I agree. I, and I think in many cases, though, the original sin here is what the federal government has done and the clumsiness of the Biden administration, because. Of course, if you're um, somebody who just crossed the border and you hear via TikTok or whatever that New York City is a place where you can stay for free in shelters for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days at a time, of course, you know, you're a rational actor and it's in your self-interest to go do that. And then the right. federal government tells you that you can't actually get work authorization and you don't actually know how to get an ID, how to secure housing for yourself, and also, most crucially, how to actually make a living. So I feel as though we're setting them up for horrible failure because the federal government is sort of the thing that really, really needs to get out of the way fundamentally on this very, you know, th this is the original sin at the root of it. The original sin is not necessarily um, the work ethics of these people who are coming in across the border. This is the libertarianism thing, though, where it's like, wouldn't it be nice if, wouldn't it be nice if we had this plus the government wouldn't be involved, but the government is involved. The government I'm not saying the government doesn't need to be involved at all. Especially in a city like, say, like New York, where you have these super, super left wing uh, places where everyone's going to go and it's it's always going to be a problem and it's like the the thing that would work here on immigration is to just police the border that's the thing that would work that's the easiest that's the lowest hanging fruit is to get is to just not allow the amnesty in the or the uh i'm sorry what do they declare when they come here it's the fake they say they're asylum, 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 MSP, right, um, asylum. Yeah. change the asylum yeah. rules and <laughs> and shut down the fucking border or at least tightly control the border uh, and I'll then we can have a sensible immigration policy which most americans do already are on board with <gasps> what you were saying before more h1b1 yeah. visas and things like this like i mean don't don't misunderstand board. me that's my preferred approach right like i'm just trying to identify like what's the real thing creating these people essentially being charges of the state it's the fact that they can't work to support themselves but i agree yep. with you fundamentally that a situation in which we just have um this sort of anarchic chaos of people coming across the border and a sort of feckless, impotent federal government that says, oh, I don't know what to do. We'll throw our hands up in the air. Like, I don't think that that's a good, I think that squanders public trust in the long term. And I see really, really big long term implications of that. So I want to be very clear that like my sense of what we ought to do with the border is not tethered to this libertarian fanciful thinking that, oh, everything will just turn out okay. Like, no, the way that it's currently being handled is totally unacceptable. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think, the, think sensible, the sensible libertarian policy would essentially be make visas across the board much more, much easier to obtain. And neither party seems very interested in that. 
And I, my, my feeling listening to you talk about immigration and listening to Rufo in that clip is that you're setting the bar too high for a libertarian win that is not applied to anybody else. Um, that it has to be some wholesale adoption across the board of, of libertarianism. And like Democrats the school, like, for but 60 so like years. The school choice example that he brought up, for instance, uh, which he is uh, taking credit for, I think might be a yeah. little bit overstated what there. What would Chris Rufo do to bring about mass uh, school well, choice? Well, like, what he's what? saying is that like the culture war aspect of it like brought it over the finish line, which in some cases that, some that could be true, but it was also the pandemic um, getting people pissed off about the schools, got people, uh, you know, the schools uh, kind of waking up to what the teachers unions were doing was a big inflection yeah. point. Corey yeah. DeAngelis, who used to work for Reason yeah. and now works for another school choice organization is a hardcore libertarian. I That's would awesome. give him a lot of credit for getting a lot of these bills uh, across the line. And so I, I think libertarians can, can, can take a lot of credit for that win. And it's an important win because when you're talking about our vision for the future, that is a big part of our vision is where people um, can kind of go to the align themselves with the institutions that um, support their values. And that that is what we are about, as opposed to what Chris Rufo is about, which is about making uh, passing the stop the stop woke act in Florida and sort of dictating top down what can and can't be taught in every single school in Florida or wherever else. Well, in a public school, and, right? He's not. He's not saying you can't have a woke yeah. private school. So that should be the case. If you're going to have public, this is also the problem. Is uh, do you Zach? Do you really believe in the concept of public education, or is or or do you not? Like, do you really think we should have a robust, sort of well funded public school system? I think uh, you know, get, 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 I allowing people. I, I think giving people. Um, that need help money to educate their kids is fine. I don't okay. think the state needs to be dictating curricula though. So like if you were to totally privatize the school system, um, but give out vouchers to poor people who can't afford to go to school, then yeah, I would be totally satisfied with that kind of approach. Um, yeah, so that answer is no. no. That's a very yeah. long, eloquent way of saying no, and that's fine. But that is like, if you're going to have, a, we're talking, this is the thing, like libertarians are now talking about a different world that doesn't exist. If you're talking about a world in America that exists right now, which is like we have public schools, no, you're never going to get rid of public schools for at least, let's say, the next 20 years. Maybe something crazy happens and people are like, no, we're getting rid of public schools. I mean, that's very shocking to me, the idea that that, that, that would happen. But let's yeah. let's say for right now, public schools exist. The question is what to do with them. And should this crazy, woke, regressive race bullshit be taught in schools? And I think it's very reasonable to say no, because once you in open that door, to pu public funded education, you have to, you should have a say in what that is. Why? I mean, it's, and that I think is, that's the, that, that's where the argument is. That's where the debate is right now. It's not over here with like, what about getting, uh, putting a whole new system in place entirely, which I'm open to. I mean, I don't even think kids, I feel like most kids up until sixth grade, like summer camp every day sounds great to me. I don't think people really learn much of value before then and don't have to. Like, really, they yeah. just, summer camp to... every day, Y Combinator later on. There yes. is no, we, yeah. There's no need for public schools. Um, yes. Again, I mean, you're envisioning I, a new future, Mike. That's very right. problematic. That's what I'm saying, I'm saying like, we can do that. I have all sorts of crazy ideas about how the world should actually run that would be better. Yeah. We can work towards those things. But in the meantime, like we're not abolishing public schools. So there's a question of what to do with them. And that is... And it, you think Chris Rufo's approach for dictating curriculum and what can or cannot be taught in Florida schools is I, the best I, way I mean, for I think it, we right? need to me, that's we have, plausible. We have, we have to yeah. separate uh, what you know, K-12 schools from higher education, which he also wants to apply to from corporations, which he also wants to apply these standards. And and so my well, point is really, money, again, the, 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 when, when you're giving public money to these to these schools, not even just public schools, but private schools, then you're opening the door to me having an opinion about what's taught there. Like, I don't want my money going to Harvard to be sort of raising the next generation of fucking Hamas activists like that. I don't want that. So like, I don't let's want my have a conversation about it. But there all. it's actually yeah. easier. The, yeah, there it's easier. There, I think the idea of getting behind like no more funding to private schools, I think we could get that one over the over the over the over the finish line. But getting rid of public uh, colleges, that's going to be much more difficult. I don't see a world where that happens. Um, and so there's a there you do actually. I think it's perfectly fair for a U.S. taxpayer to have a say 
in how their money is being spent. If it has to be spent on public education, then unfortunately, people are going to have an opinion on that. Um, yeah, but so, these things yeah. these things are intention, though, because um, if you're for school choice in the way that I am, ultimately, you know, I want like universal school choice here in Florida. You can take your money and you can go send your kid to a Catholic school with state money. And I think that is a great thing. Um, no, Chris Rufo, I don't think does think that's a good thing. And it sounds like you don't think that's a good thing either. So that that is a real well, I don't think that I should be saying, for the future. I, no, I do not think that I should be be forced, be forced to pay or to give, yeah, literally to give you money to take your kid to learn some crazy faith-based ideology. I don't think that no, I should have to do that. I don't that. think my money should be forcibly given to, taken to give to anybody for anything, but this is like the world we live in. So I'd rather the the money actually be controlled by the parents than the bureaucratic structure of some state. So th that's kind of the difference that that we have, I think. But I yep. do think there's there's a bigger thing here, though, which is just like, how can Rufo say that we aren't interested in winning or that libertarians haven't won, that our beliefs um, haven't won the day in a bunch of different areas when maybe you think that these are more uh, marginal wins, but they really are wins. I mean, what do you, what do you expect? Libertarians are not like it's not like we're like you know, <laughs> you know, a hundred million strong in the United States, right? Like we're a small group of people, but there are legitimate areas. Like I mean, even just well, attempting. Why are to, you a small group of people? Libertarians, it's been around for a long time. We're all autistic. Are you kidding me? We're terrible at like we're not Think fun to that. be around. It's not a compelling. The ideology is not compelling, and there has to be a reason for that. And I think it's because libertarianism is, is essentially an it's like a it's an absence of vision which makes sense theoretically maybe rationally is not compelling on a human level people want to know what it is specifically that you're trying to build and they believe in the concept i think the average person does believe in the concept of a government that does things for them like that creates the thing that lays the groundwork that has the roads has the public transit there's a school like every president is voted in because people have this they articulate a clear king. vision for day one, I'll do X, Y, and Z. And the first few days, I'll do... Yeah, I mean, I think there's different schools of thought within libertarianism as to the role that the federal government ought to play. But like, at least in terms of how I look at it and my ideal form of government, it's not the government needs to be abolished entirely. It's not even like, oh, government should refrain from building roads. Like, there are a whole bunch of functions that I view as essential that I'm totally comfortable with. It's more of a matter of like, are there different piecemeal ways that we can really get the state out of the way to allow people to just have a little bit more individual choice to be able to start their own business uh, free of having to get a stupid license for flower arranging right. um, to make sure that agents of the state like police state like police officers are actually held accountable when they abuse people and deprive them of their civil liberties because they just don't think that they're above the law. Um, it, you know, it's some of these little things like this, which I think libertarians really have had concrete, substantive policy wins where it's like, OK, I don't believe that I'm going to be able to wave a magic wand and have everybody be, you know, reading Hayek all the time the way that I would like. But I'm trying to be realistic about like what are smaller steps we could take toward a better, slightly freer world. And I really see libertarians delivering in this, at least to a greater degree than Chris Rufo is. Well, you just said the problem. It's like it, it, I think the freedom thing specifically works when you have it. It does not work if you have it in some places and not others. For example, the immigration that I was talking about before, like freedom of movement, but also there's a welfare state is the worst possible world. So, or it's the worst possible version of immigration and welfare is to have unlimited I immigration and the welfare. So that's the, that's my one, that's my major problem with it, with it really is it that it's like, it doesn't seem to work when you do it piecemeal. You can have these little wins, but if you have a little win in something like, I don't know, drugs, for example, drug le like uh, let's decriminalize or let's just legalize opioids. But you also believe that the state is responsible for housing opioid addicts for the rest of their life. Then you get San Francisco. You really do. That's what the housing there is. It's like people are doing drugs and entitled to housing and, um, and life. But these are the what most if, extreme examples of like libertarianism. That's where like, I live. Like run, I, run them I, up, I, right? I'm in like, San Francisco right now. That's the world. That no, no, yeah, abs absolutely. But it's like oh. the, no libertarian. I think at oh. least the libertarianism that I uh, support and espouse is not one that's like like I am worried about some of the awful externalities created by what happens if we have you know mass access to heroin and fentanyl, right? Like I'm I'm I consider myself a pretty reasonable libertarian, where it's like I don't necessarily want 
uh, borders thrown open and fentanyl vending machines in every freaking school, right? And so I, no, I feel, I feel legitimately out, great. Sell out. That's Zach. Zach I, I'm sure I'm going to get like fired for this, but it. I, I legitimately right. think <laughs> it's sometimes it's like machines. libertarians are almost caricatured into this like more extreme and cartoonish version of what we actually are, where it's like, I don't know. I remember when I was like 18 and I was given a, I was in a, a sticky legal situation. We'll just put it that way for smoking marijuana uh, in Virginia. And it's like 10 years later, it's pretty freaking awesome that I don't ever have to find myself. I live in New York now, uh, but even in Virginia, I think it's, you know, getting more lax over time. Like it's pretty glorious that I don't have to fear literal imprisonment for a thing that I do uh, in the same way that I consume white wine. Like to me, these things, which may seem really, really small, are just there are these little small steps that we're taking to move in the direction of freedom. And I understand that that's not the sexiest vision in the world, but like we're a small group of people and we have actually delivered uh, some of these major yeah, wins. Th there's also some pretty, I would say some pretty big wins that the libertarian movement has exerted. And I mean, would you consider if there was this society, let's say, of federalists who were uh, largely made up of libertarians and in putting people <laughs> on influential <laughs> positions within the judicial branch that then struck things down like unconstitutional vaccine mandates, uh, <laughs> you know, gun laws, that that would be considered a major so win? Or is that just yes. something along well, the edges? <laughs> let's talk about that. Yeah. Because I think that brilliant, one of the most brilliant political, like long-term political strategies probably in American history, the problem with it is it was Full, the idea, the like culture in America has not changed. It, there was never an attempt to really persuade yeah. lots of people. And so what that means is we now have a, a situation where- We have the legitimacy of the Supreme Court continuously called into question regardless of what they're it's gonna get, doing. I think that yeah. what's going to happen is eventually the court's going to get packed. And, the, and it's I'll like, you, if you don't change- Amazing. And if only there was a libertarian magazine who did an entire cover story warning people of the perils of court packing several years ago. If only we had libertarians. Well, but it's in coming. Room. Though at the end of the day, everything's just about power at that at that level, yeah. and everybody knows it. And they're gonna. It's very simple. It's like the court is not allowing us to do what we want. Therefore, we're going to abolish the concept, and they're gonna do it. It's just a matter of time. And unless you change, if you unless you actually change the way that most people think about this stuff. We're going to be living in a very scary, like left wing judicial world. I, I think mm -hmm. probably, I think it's unless Donald Trump really is a fascist dictator and he's going to be, you know, the the uh, king for the rest of his life. Um, I, I think the Democrats end up taking the court, um, and I think yeah. they do it in a really gnarly, scary, like pack the court sort of way. Um, I hope I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Probably I'm wrong. If if, if I'm wrong, then yeah. I agree that that was I killer victory on the libertarian side. <laughs> I think that this is the part of your critique that is most salient to me, right? Like this idea of like, what good are the wins um, in terms of, you know, wh who the Supreme Court is composed of or in terms of all of these different policy wins, like what good are they if there's not a culture that um, continues to sort of uphold and believe in their legitimacy, right? Like we just have this massive tension that feels like it's reaching a boiling point where um, people either don't understand some of these basic constitutional precepts or don't care about them, or I, I'm not totally sure what it is, but a sense of cultural sickness and a sense that people are not actually truly yearning to be free and to think deeply through unintended consequences. That is the thing that really concerns me. It feels like we have this cultural mismatch. So we, maybe we're logging, maybe we're notching some policy wins, uh, but what good is it in the long run? Yeah, I think we've been living off of the fumes we're living on the fumes of of what our founding fathers believed in i think probably most people never believed in what our founding fathers believed in even in america but that the legal it was structured so well early on that it took a very 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 long time to unwind it and now we're dealing with populism and um in either left-wing or right-wing populism is going to cut in a really scary way probably i mean is my sense and without the legal protections like I think we just get closer to that world by the day. Yeah. And like uh, in contrast to libertarians, you do have a positive vision yeah. for what you think America should be. You've already laid out your plan for San Francisco. Can you give us like one or two bullet points uh, as to what America, like what should we be looking forward to? Like what, sh what should we build in the future? The moon should, America, Mike. The moon should be a state. That's the, the very <laughs> first thing. 
I believe in like an expanding America. I believe yeah. that like honestly, I think Cuba and Greenland should both be states as well. I believe in a Good. bigger America, a progressive America, an America with uh let's see what do i believe in for america america i'm sort of a like i mean i think that america is this states state by state america will be a little bit different i do believe that i think that people should be able to congregate wherever they want they will always be able to hopefully in america and build whatever community they want to live in and whatever state they want to live in but in general america should be growing and thriving and expanding and it should be free as ma as free as you can be without hurting yourself um, yeah. is, is sort of my, uh, it's not libertarianism. Libertarianism is like my true North star, but I think you want to be walking <laughs> towards that, um, <laughs> cautiously and, uh, you just, yeah, technologically progressive, super abundant world where yeah. food is cheap, water is cheap, school is cheap, energy is cheap, and people are able to be whatever they want to be. Hmm. What? So we have a new, uh, segment on this show and then we will wrap. And it's basically asking our guests to ruminate on the conversation we just had and saying, hey, Mike Solana, what's the number one question that you think more people should be asking right now? Who is actually in charge? And I think that one's maybe the most important. I think people, generally speaking, don't know why the world immediately around them is fucked. We have this common idea that it's the president. Um, no. In COVID, it didn't matter if it was Joe Biden or Donald Trump. What mattered was who your who was on the board of education is what mattered Isn't for that most parents. Who was that crazy Looney Tune who was elected when I wasn't paying attention, and why is she in charge? And uh, you're <laughs> never. Always is she, isn't it? Uh, well, there were a lot of she's on the board, but there it's not. It's not of, no, I agree with you. Yeah, there, are, there, there were a lot on the on the education. Deranged Randy Weingarten. Um, but it's like when, when your school is shut down and they're renaming it, but not letting your kids go to school, and your life's living hell because of this decision. If you're if you don't even know who's responsible for that decision, then you are never going to be able to solve that problem. You have to actually know who the people. Um, who the people are who are in charge around you and that will engage you locally and i think that that is where everything in america changes that's the world that we're living in is a world of local politics like our day-to-day -day experience is truly shaped by that and most of us are not paying attention to it at all and so that's the question is like who is like you see something that's that's broken i want you to really ask yourself like who is responsible for that what, what if i had to find a person who would they be and it's always going to be someone i really 90 percent of the time it's going to be someone who lives within like a five square mile, like within five miles of you is, is, is what I think. Probably the libertarians, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always the libertarians. Uh, <laughs> it's Mike a great Solana. question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for talking to Reese. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.